Five Trends Defining China's Marketing Industry. Now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Trevor Lai in Shanghai. We're bringing you a special edition of our show today. This is the 50th episode of Thoughtful China, and we're celebrating that milestone by identifying common themes and challenges facing marketers in China today that we've heard from our guests on our show over the past year. First, digital media is more important than ever, as advertisers find traditional media is too expensive and inefficient. Plus, many Chinese are more interested in online content than their TV set, changing the nature of marketing and retailing forever. Here's what our experts had to say. And I think it's important to remember that in China, the, the internet uses a lot younger than in the West because uh, the development of, of the Chinese economy and when the internet arrived. So you're looking at a lot of under 35 people. And for them, the internet is their primary medium for not just self-expression, but entertainment. So they, use, they, they, they play games more than sending emails. And they're watching a lot of uh, movies and TV shows online. So I think that's some of the key difference in the way that they perceive the internet. So, it's entertainment, it's supposed to be fun. We, we're seeing a digital evolution taking place where if more and more people of the network actually come online, then they will actually start to take part in social networks as well. Um, right now, they're mostly doing through online video. So online video is huge in China, as you know. Um, we actually seen a lot of houses we visited in, in lower tiers where they don't actually have TV sets at home. So a lot of people are saying that my computer is not my TV, right? Um, so we actually do a lot of online video um, advertisements, like pre-rolls and let's say the, the banner ads on those online video websites. Yeah. Uh, for other clients, it's really been about changing the media mix. And that's where we've seen a rise in online video mm -hmm. uh, and overall, overall digital usage and digital share of the media budget rising. Not only because the demand from consumers continues to, to increase, but also because uh, cost effectiveness and cost per thousand reach uh, can often be delivered more effectively in an online environment. In, in China, digital marketing really coming um, into its own a bit more uh, and not going for the lowest common denominator that I feel a lot of brands um, have adopted simply because they go, we should be on digital. We're seeing some clients increase spending in online video for the right reasons or the wrong reasons. We certainly have clients who will need to be retaught that an iGRP and an online GRP is, is not exactly what you need to be doing for your consumers for every reason. Um, and we'll need to get those clients to move forward in understanding what engagements are. Um, but the fact of the matter is they're increasing spending, some of them 400% year over year, which is massive. Another trend many of our guests have commented on is the rise of social media in China. Marketers can no longer get away with talking at customers. They have to find a way to interact with them while being entertaining, engaging, and relevant. That's a tall order. Here's more about this trend from recent guests on our show. Social is not new in China. Um, you know, there have been online forums which are hugely popular in China. You know, they, they came about in the late 90s when Sina and Sohu launched the big part of the social media landscape here. There are already so-called Facebooks here with Rinrin and Kaixin. There are uh, Twitters here uh, with Sina, Weibo, Tencent, Weibo, and even those are more than just a Twitter, t Twitter clone. Um, and so there are a lot of different social media properties providing value in a very fragmented uh, social media landscape. So I'm just not sure what unique value or compelling value that a Facebook book could provide. That uh, we've definitely seen Weibo taking time away from uh, time spent on Renren. Uh, Kaishin's still maintaining, according to the latest iResearch stats. But I think the, use, the reasons why you go to a Kaishin or a Renren are kind of different from Weibo because uh, Rinrin and Kaishin are your, your real friends, people you actually know, and there's a great, uh, there's, a, there's a different kind of interactivity when you share photos on Kaishin or Rinrin, whereas Weibo is much more about gossip, celebrity, entertainment, being in the moment, being the first to share interesting news. Well, as our chairman, Lou Frankfurt, constantly says to Wall Street, China is our single largest geographical opportunity for the brand at the moment. And is there a risk with its size and with its importance of it growing and becoming too big or too important, as we've talked about with other brands, perhaps relying on the market too much or having it take up too much of a share in terms of its global sales? At our stage of, of growth and expansion in China, that's not, that's not going to be the case for some time. Uh, we're still uh, predominantly uh, driven by North America and a couple of external markets such as Japan. Um, while our growth rate in China is uh, the fastest within the company, 
uh, it's still a very small percentage of our global revenue. Um, so we're actually fighting hard to go as fast as we can uh, to grow the business here. So a lot of room for growth in the coming years. Boundless room for growth. And as part of that, and we've talked about this at the conference today, obviously social media is going to be an important balancing tool uh, mm -hmm. within your, your sort of arsenal here in China. Talk about how Coach uses social media in China. Well, we, we've just gotten into it in a big way. Uh, back in September uh, of last year, we had about 2,500 fans on Weibo. Uh, we started our campaigns uh, in uh, October. Uh, as of today, we have over 425,000 fans on Weibo. We're the number one luxury brand in terms of fan base. Uh, on Sina Weibo today, we overtook Burberry about a month and a half ago. So we've really seen a huge amount of traction uh, from some of the work that we've done uh, on the Weibo platform, um, but also through Coach.com, through some of the other social media platforms. I think it's super important. Um, we're distorting budget towards it uh, right. based on those successes. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to be quite careful. Uh, you've got to be a curator of your own content and material. Uh, and you really have to have control as you would with any other media platform. But it's interesting, I mean, with that amount of growth and other brands obviously looking at the same opportunity, what are some of the key factors that you attribute your success to? Because it's more about than just posting photos about your products no, and news links and things exactly. like that. Exactly. No, we've, we've, we've come up with some in innovative and engaging uh, uh, platforms. Uh, for example, Chinese New Year, we, we put together a, 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 the ability for people to send Chinese New Year messages to one another. We've done applications on, on Sina Weibo where people can mix and match and put together their perfect outfit and their perfect look and then send it to their friends. So we're quite active in terms of de delivering fun and innovative content uh, on these platforms. It's not just letting people talk to one another, it's actually engaging with them with some content. Well, I think, you know, Consumer Day, which is every year at the same time, is a very intense day for most companies because on that day, there are three or four brands announced that consumers have voted as being not of a high enough quality. Uh, you know, HP last year lost a lot of market share just purely based on Consumer Day. So, uh, you know, consumers do have a voice in, in certain areas in China. And I think because of the, the rise of Chinese Weibo, it's actually mm. a good channel for Chinese people actually to voice out what they think of the brand and how they feel. So th that, that's something that the listening and monitoring of social media actually come into play. The, the way that a brand embraces consumer may not necessarily be interacting with them you know, uh, energetically, but in a way is to embrace and listening to what they have to say and make sure that we deliver the service in the right way. Yeah, there's now 191 million uh, Chinese social media users. It's more than the entire inter internet population in the United States. So, yeah. and that's only going to continue to grow. Which, which means the monitoring is not so easy because that's where they're expressing themselves. So you got to you got to build up relatively yep. sophisticated ways to monitor because that's where it's happening. The buzzwords about China today are slowing GDP growth, high inflation, rising public debt, and sluggish stock performance which means advertisers need to be more careful than ever about where they invest their budgets and what ROI to expect going forward. China is still growing, yes, but not as fast. Let's hear what past guests had to say. Well, I'm a little bit more skeptical, actually. I mean, uh, so far there's no apples falling from the tree, um, but I do think that there's quite a bit of nervousness and a little bit for some of our multinationals uh, for a wait-and-see approach. and. Uh, so nobody's bullish in our forecasting right now. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, rationalization going on. You know, some of our financial service clients, some of our IT clients, you know, they're really waiting to see what's going to be happening and they're structuring themselves more efficiently. Television advertising is still projected to have an inflation rate of 30%. When, I, when she uh, told me about her top 20 clients, all right, their average budget increase was 12%. So right there you can ar already see that the dollars are stretching much less further. So this is putting a lot of pressure on a lot of the marketers to explore uh, quote non-traditional uh, uh, unquote approaches to building brands. And historically, since time immemorial, the most challenging part of being in China is the cost of building and establishing brand equity. So it's just getting more and more difficult. Absolutely. I think that um, we had a peak in, um, in growth in December or 9, I think. And of course, we're still growing steadily, but um, we're reaching a um, saturational level. And um, 
we're not going to see the, the growth that we've seen before. Yeah, I think there are two aspects that we have to put forward here. The one thing is that we need to talk about the normalization of the market development. We have seen in 2009 and 2010 a real extraordinary growth which has come down in 2011 because a lot of uh, incentives for purchasing vehicles were taken away. And what we see is indeed the 10% uh, growth uh, and we assume that in 2012 it will be again somewhere in the double digit uh, figures uh, is simply a normal development of the market because it is not sustainable that the market every year grows by 30%. This leads exactly to the traffic jams, to the infrastructure problems, to the environmental problems and so on. Here's something else multinationals need to watch carefully. Local companies are getting a lot better at brand building and they're starting to invest overseas. You should expect more and better competition, both in China and back home. Uh, they may not exactly know how to build a brand, but they certainly know, uh, they still have the desire. They certainly have uh, the need. You don't have to tell them that uh, you need to build a brand, why you need to build a brand. Um, they, otherwise, they won't come to us. But uh, in terms of how, they may not have the total like process, but I think overall they do have a pretty good concept. As I said, the spectrum may be those are more sophisticated and those are less sophisticated. So we actually work with both. Right. And um, um, you know, some are so sophisticated that I think they, they have a very good sense of the market. They know already that you know, all these terminologies because they've read all the books and they've done it all. And they're pretty sophisticated. They're pretty specific marketers. Um, it's, it's a lot more competitive than people make it out, people think. They're using the social media, they're using television, they're using print media, they're using events, they're using mass sponsorship, sponsorship of huge events like um, the, the Olympics or the Asian Games or Expo and to quite effective um, ways of doing it as well. And they're not paying very much because they're canny <laughs> and they know their market. So for a foreign brand that wants to come in and probably do the same um, sponsorship, they might end up paying a lot more than a local Chinese brand. If you want to look at more sort of consumer brands, um, I think the brands that you're going to probably see go overseas in the future most successfully are automotive brands because they'll be able to change the value equation in the dynamics and similar to the way electronics companies from Japan or Korea did it many years ago. They were able to bring in products at a lower price but of good enough quality and they were sufficiently different in price that consumers can say, well, wait a minute, I'll take a chance. I'll, you know, I'll have a closer look at this. Our fifth and final trend is the rapid expansion of luxury brands in China. I, I think you're right. There are an awful lot of tourists going to Europe with a view to buying luxury products. And I think you're seeing some very good examples. If you look at Harrods, they've actually bought in 75 union pay machines so that people can just use their own local cards and get money out. And they've got about 80 Chinese-speaking staff. So they're really encouraging Chinese luxury shoppers. And you've got the same thing going on in France, Galerie Lafayette, and even individual stores, Louis Vuitton and all those, are also bringing in the Chinese-speaking staff. So that's definitely a bonus, but I think they can do a lot more. Uh, I think that a uh, uh, professional in travel industry make a mistake with the price issue because they think that Chinese consumers are obsessed with the low price, with getting a discount. I think it may have been true in the past, but now we talk a lot with Chinese advent travelers and they say to us, I can afford to pay for a luxury hotel. I really can afford it. And it is exactly my social status. And they don't like when some Chinese traditional outbound travel agency will offer to them to stay in a low class hotel or when they want to book a, a plane ticket will automatically tell her, okay, this is the lowest price. I do not offer them to fly in first or business class. I think this is a big mistake because now the new generation of Chinese customers and even the upper middle class, they are ready to spend money. So we say to our clients, dare to offer the very best 
to your Chinese clients because they can definitely afford and they will be flattered to be offered an expensive product with a high quality. No, not only my old clients. It is about um, every client in the upper premium um, luxury segment where it's really, really about a lot of money. Uh, there we see that consumers really care about, okay, is it a genuine product? So that's why they prefer to travel to Europe to be absolutely sure this is the real deal. And once they are in the store, they go for the highest price. Uh, which it by, in that sense is a uh, determinator of, of quality. Do I get the best that is available? And Elon, what's your reaction to the Johnny Walker house? Why would an investment like this pay off for Diageo? It's a um, great experience and I think experience does matter a lot for the luxury consumers because they need to feel the brand. It's very important for them to really understand the culture of brand and believe in what the brand is selling to them. I'll give you an example of the, um, I think Cartier did something really great, which is Art de Cartier, the Art of Cartier, which is um, the exhibition of the classic jewelries of Cartier. I think the first one is 2004 in Shanghai Museum and the second one is in Beijing Palace Museum, um, a national museum. There's millions of people just went there to see the classic jewelries and, and they really believe in what Cartier is selling, selling that uh, um, king of jewelry and <laughs> jewelry for king, things like that. I think definitely they convey the brand image directly to the target consumers. So knowing that there is an incredible amount of change going on right now, what are some of the trends that you're seeing moving forward, especially in the luxury brand segment? Um, I, I think uh, what, we're, what we're seeing is, is people are saying that at least from a, uh, a consumer standpoint, um, uh, consumers are becoming more discreet um, and, and I assume that recent political events might make them even more discreet as they go forward. Uh, they're, they're very knowledge driven, uh, connoisseurship driven um, and you have a whole group of 20 to 40 year olds that have been there, done that overspoiled, over pampered by the brands. So I think that's going to pose problems for brands, the bigger brands that have had established positions like LV, Gucci, Prada um, going forward. I, I think people are looking for something different. And if you look at the cosmetic sector, for instance, if you look at the, the share of the top five brands, it has actually gone down in the last couple of years. So concentration is going in the reverse uh, direction because people are looking for novelty and, and the distribution channel that's done that the best is Sifa. Sifa positions itself on, on, on new brands and, and I think that's going into the other luxury categories where people are wanting to see new, different, edgier brands. So the rise of Balenciaga, um, we're working a little bit with YSL. YSL is, is, is you know, getting a good response considering it's been sort of a dormant brand in, in China so far. Right. In 2004, Chinese spent $2 billion on luxury goods, according to Ernst & Young. Last year, they spent about $15.6 billion, putting China on course to become the world's largest luxury market by 2015. But we're ending with this trend because we want to look forward, and there are signs that luxury sales are starting to slow down in China. 11 of 13 shops and chains surveyed in Hong Kong by Bloomberg News reported no pickup in July in purchases by mainland Chinese consumers. Watch, clock, and jewelry sales in that city gained 3.1% in June from a year earlier, down from a 59% increase in the same month in 2011. China has always been a tough market full of contradictions, so perhaps it's fitting that we're ending this show with mixed signals. This is one of the world's fastest growing markets, but clearly it's not immune to the world's financial problems. That wraps it up for today. We hope you'll tune in for our next 50 episodes. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. See you again.